my impression is that that's getting less. I think, you know, when you and I first talked about ALK, which is, you know, what, three years ago now, it feels like it was longer, but it's really a relatively short space of time, there was a big gap. But now, you know, the community has got their head around it, the patients have got their head around it, and they're going in and demanding it. Most of my patients have had EGFR and ALK testing done when I, when I see them for a second opinion. And I think, again, with the idea that a commercial company will say, we'll make it easy, and, you know, there are some which are already doing multiplex testing, it's going to come and that gap will get smaller. I agree with you, but I think it's partly regional. I'm astounded by the number of patients I see who have not had any testing, who clearly had sufficient material, where weeks have gone by and it's not been sent out. I think uh, clinicians know that these tests exist. They know that they should probably do them. They're confused as to which ones they should do. They really don't know very much about the multiplex uh, platforms uh, that exist. They're not sure which company they should send it to. They're not sure which tests each company can do. Yeah. And it's that degree of sort of confusion and bewilderment that I think fuels some degree of uh, um, stagnation on the part of uh, some of the uh, uh, community uh, physicians. Uh, increasingly, they do it. Certainly, they do EGFR. And I think they do it correctly. They do it pretty much in all adenocarcinomas and all never smokers, even the occasional uh, squamous cell patient who's a never smoker, a remote former smoker. But they really aren't sure what else to do. And because the numbers in their practice are limited, it's relatively rare that any of them have seen an ALK translocation or ROS1. And they think, well, what's the point? Yeah. And so I think if these molecular abnormalities were more prevalent, were more common, perhaps they'd embrace it a little bit more wholeheartedly. But it's, I agree with you, it's coming. And I think as time goes on and uh, the comfort level builds with all of this, and there's some clear path in terms of how to sort of accelerate the process, it'll be embraced more and more. So some of it will come with increased education. Some will come with increased access to mm -hmm. being the testing. What do you think in terms of insurance firms saying we're going to reimburse this but not this? So I think the salutary aspect of this is that, particularly with the uh, multiplex platforms, you can do a number at once with, uh, and, that, and in the process reduce the cost and still bill for the part that's, still, uh, that's clearly actionable. Yeah. So EGFR and ALK are bona fide actionable abnormalities and uh, to a great extent they'll pay for the other tests. At least that's what our um, pathologists have told us. I don't know if that's always going to be the case, but uh, as we develop new drugs to target some of the other molecular abnormalities, I think that the reimbursement will expand ultimately. Because one of the things I've seen with some of the commercial companies who will remain nameless is they'll send off RT-PCR and immunohistochemistry and a whole bunch of stuff which is rather questionable. And presumably, they're charging somebody for it. They're, you know, they're for-profit organizations. And, of course. <laughs> and I think you know, we could certainly tighten down on you know, wasting tissue and wasting resource in that regard. I think uh, I'm still alarmed by the propensity of some of these companies to do uh, markers that really have not been validated, uh, particularly those uh, for the cytotoxic, so ERCC1. Uh -huh. and TS, as far as I'm concerned, has not been validated in lung cancer. And uh, until that happens, I think that, too, engenders a certain degree of c confusion amongst uh, our fellow practitioners. And I'm not sure how those are reimbursed at all. I would think they're not. 